There are different testicular abnormalities that you will have to know for your examination purposes and I'm going to review those with you. But before doing that, first I would like to discuss how the testicles will descend during the embryonic development. So here I have a three-dimensional image which shows you how the testicles, processus vaginalis, as well as gubernaculum are running through the inguinal canal. So gubernaculum shows the path through which the testicles can descend from the abdomen into the scrotum and then processus vaginalis is an outpouching of the peritoneum that runs in front of the testicles. So here I have a two-dimensional image which shows you that the testicles will descend into the um, scrotum and it's the gubernaculum that shows the path through which the uh, testicles can descend into the scrotum. In front of the testicles there is this processus vaginalis and after development the uh, processus vaginalis will turn into tunica vaginalis. So tunica vaginalis is an embryonic remnant of the processus vaginalis. Now with that information in mind we can now review the cryptoorchidism. So cryptoorchidism is a failure of normal descent of the testes into the scrotum. So here you can see on this side, the testes has normally descended into the scrotum. But then on the other side of the image, we have either abdominal, inguinal, or upper scrotal cryptoorchidism. And the problem with this condition is that spermatogenesis requires a temperature of less than 37 degrees C, which is available in the scrotum. So here there is more air circulation around the scrotum, and so as a consequence of which the body temperature is less than 37 degrees C. But then inside the abdomen, the temperature is about 37 degrees C. So spermatogenesis cannot happen in the testicles that have not properly descended. So therefore, bilateral Cryptoorchidism will result in infertility. And then some other changes that you may see with bilateral cryptoorchidism is, for instance, decreased testosterone secretion. While with the unilateral cryptoorchidism, since there is already one testis that, that has descended, testosterone secretion is normal. So with bilateral cryptoorchidism, there is infertility as well as decreased testosterone secretion. Now in addition, there are degenerative changes inside the Sertoli cells as a consequence of which there would be decreased level of inhibin hormone. And then inhibin is required for decreasing the levels of LH and FSH. So now that inhibin is decreased, there won't be any more negative feedback on FSH and LH, and therefore luteinizing hormone as well as follicular stimulating hormone would be elevated in these patients. Another reason that these two hormones are elevated is that testosterone is also providing a negative feedback to LH and FSH. And so since the testosterone level is low, now the LH and FSH would be elevated. And then the other complication that can arise with cryptoorchidism is increased risk of testicular cancer. And then in terms of the treatment, it's recommended to surgically reposition cryptoorchidism into the scrotum in order to preserve fertility. And the timing is recommended to be between six months to two years of age. Now notice that after this repositioning, there would be decreased risk of testicular cancer, but still the risk is more than the general population. So even after you reposition the testicles into the scrotum, there is still higher chance of testicular cancer compared to the general population. The next condition is hydrocele, where there is a fluid accumulation in tunica vaginalis or a patent processus vaginalis. And these patients generally present with painless scrotal swelling. And one important finding that you will see on examination is a positive translumination test. So if you shine light on the uh, testicles of these patients, there would be a positive translumination test. And this is due to the fact that there are only fluid inside the scrotum and thus light can travel through the entire scrotum. But then on the other hand, if there was a testicular mass, the light would have been blocked and therefore there wouldn't be any translumination of the scrotum. Now in terms of the treatment, the most common treatment that is used is the surgery surgical excision of the hydrocele sac. So you cannot really use aspiration to treat this condition because it will rapidly accumulate the fluids and it will go back to this condition again. So you will have to use the surgical excision of the hydrocele for this condition.
The next condition is varicocele, where due to the increased venous pressure, there would be dilated and tortuous veins in the pampiniform plexus. And then on physical examination, it has a texture of a bag of worms. So here you can see that on this image, it's as if there are like worms that are filled inside the sac right here. Now, other features of varicocele is that it's observed usually with standing position, and if the patient lies down, it would disappear. Now, you should also know that about 90% of varicoceles are on the left side. And can you think of the reason why varicoceles are usually on the left side? And the answer is due to the difference in the venous drainage of the left testicles compared to the right testicle. So here I'm showing you the anatomy of the left and right gonadal vein. So the left gonadal vein goes at about 90 degree angle into the left renal vein. So there is more venous pressure in the left gonadal vein compared to the right gonadal vein, which directly goes into the inferior vena cava. So therefore, since there is increased venous pressure, on the left side, therefore, there is increased risk of varicocele to be seen in the left testicles. And so commonly, usually when a patient has, like for instance, the left renal mass, that's the time that it would increase the pressure and varicocele will develop. Now, features that are associated with varicocele is inc include, for instance, decreased fertility due to the increased temperature of the testicles. So again, since there is too much blood that accumulates here, the temperature increase, and so therefore there would be decreased fertility. Now, in terms of the clinical presentations, these patients could be asymptomatic, or they may present with a dull, aching pain that is usually in the left scrotum. And then in terms of the treatment, in adults, usually they use conservative treatments, but then if the patient has bilateral varicoceles or if the varicoceles are symptomatic and have too much pain and swelling, then the surgical ligation or testicular vein embolization are the recommended treatment options. The next condition is testicular torsion, which can be caused by congenital anatomic abnormalities, or it can be caused by trauma or sudden movement, where there would be twisting of the spermatic cord. As a consequence of which, there would be problem with the venous drainage, as well as the arterial supply. So now arteries can no longer supply the testicles and the um, venous blood cannot exit the testicles either. And so clinical presentations of these patients include a, an abrupt, sudden, severe testicular pain that is constant and is usually associated with nausea and vomiting. And then in terms of the physical findings, there would be loss of the cremastic reflex. Testis is usually slightly elevated due to the um, twisting of the spermatic cord. And then elevation of the scrotal contents either does not relieve the pain or could make the pain worse. So these are important findings that will help you differentiate the epididymitis from the testicular torsion. So with epididymitis, the cremasteric reflex is normal. And then elevation of the scrotal content usually relieves the pain with epididymitis. But then with testicular torsion, the cremasteric reflex is lost, and then elevation of the scrotal contents does not relieve the pain. Now in terms of the diagnosis, usually clinical diagnosis is accurate enough because the, some of these findings are uh, impossible to miss, like severe pain that is associated with nausea and vomiting, loss of cremastic reflex, and, um, and no uh, re pain relief with elevation of the testicles. But then if the results are equivocal and you cannot uh, for sure say if the patient, for instance, has testicular torsion or epididymitis, then you can use Doppler ultrasound to help confirm the diagnosis. And then in terms of the treatment, it requires emergent surgical detorsion as well as fixation by orchiopexy. The final condition is epididymitis, where there is an inflammation of the epididymis. And this condition is more commonly seen in late adolescents, which are more sexually active. 
as a consequence of which chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea, which are the common sexually transmitted uh, diseases, are more common causes of epididymitis in adolescence patients. And then E. coli, which is the number one cause of urinary tract infection, is the less common cause of the epididymitis in adolescents. In older patients, however, after the age of 35, E. coli is the more common cause compared to chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, in terms of the uh, physical findings, there would be an acute pain and swelling. Cremasteric reflex is normal and the pain is relieved by elevation of the testes. And this is referred to as pren sign. So just note that compared to the testicular torsion, which there was loss of cremasteric reflex and no pain relief with elevation of the testes, here with epididymitis, the cremasteric reflex is normal and then elevation of the testes will relieve the pain. As for the diagnosis, you can again diagnose clinically or if you are not sure, you can use the Doppler ultrasound. And then for the treatment, you can provide patients with ice and NSAIDs to help with the pain or even uh, elevate the testicles to relieve the pain and then you must also provide them with the antibiotics directed at chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea and do you recall what um, antibiotics are used for these two organisms so you use ceph triaxon for Neisseria gonorrhea and then for chlamydia you use doxycycline now, azithromycin is another medication that can also be used for the treatment of chlamydia, but since there has been more resistant cases, therefore it's recommended to use doxycycline and ceftriaxone. And that concludes our discussion of the testicular abnormalities.